Brother Paul Vaughn was originally scheduled to speak at this hour. Brother Vaughn is uh, back in Kentucky. He was diagnosed with pneumonia, what uh, in the country we call epizootis. And uh, so uh, we are sorry for Brother Vaughn's not being able to be here. He's a great gospel preacher, very sound. I love and appreciate his work, especially in the restoration matters study of restoration history itself. And, uh, but we have Brother David Brown will be pinch hitting this afternoon. David Philip Brown. So many have assumed that P means Paul, but uh, it's Philip. He was born in 1946 in Camden, Arkansas, was married to the former Joanne Anglin of Jackson, Tennessee. Four children, Timothy, Carrie, Rebecca, Rachel, and 15 grandchildren. But and we could go on and on about his accomplishments, and which are many. But the thing that I respect most about him is this. He is a faithful gospel preacher. And I think that's the best compliment that can be given to any man other than that of a faithful elder. Preach the gospel. Well, I don't know. I think it's Brother Buddy that put him up to doing this, and I think maybe he might have thought he was going to gouge at me a whole lot, but he didn't. I certainly appreciate the way that he has said those kind of things about me. I could spend a lot of time talking regarding Daniel's ability, but everybody knows that too. So, I don't mind saying that when it comes down to being in debate and about any other way, uh, Brother Daniel sitting right next to me, I will brag on him here and hope it doesn't stop in a long time to come, but he has the most amazing ability to recall. Some of you may not know it, but he never had himself a promise, what, 30 some odd years ago to read a book a week. Now, when you come every year and see all these books that he's selling out here, those are the ones he's read and he doesn't need them anymore. <laughs> but uh, he does. He has a tremendous recall. He's sound in the faith, a great preacher, and we appreciate him being here and his ability. And what he said regarding being noted as a gospel preacher, that is the way I feel about it. I don't think there's much you can say greater than to find a person that has spent their life as a preacher of the gospel and been faithful to it unless he said is one doing the work of a faithful elder or both. Now I'm going to be talking about the matter of restoration and unity. And I want to go over several things. We'll see how time works out for us this afternoon. I'm very sorry but Paul couldn't be here. I, this is the first time that he has missed since we got started somewhere along that because he started coming down. And he regretted it, but he called last week, said, I think I got the flu, and more of the doctor and asked, I feel terrible. And then he said, well, call me back and tell me what happened. And so he did, and he said, I don't have the flu, they've diagnosed with pneumonia. So I said, well, at least maybe they can get you over that. He said, well, they've given me this, that, and the other, and they gave me a steroid shot. I said, you're going to get to go to Congress. <laughs> but anyway, he's, I hope he's progressing well, and maybe he's able to watch us even over this. In Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16, the weeping prophet of to Judah said, Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. And you know what the people said. The people said, We will not walk therein. That's amazing, but that's what they said. That's how they answered. That's in the Bible. It has something to say to us today. It should warn us and cause us to understand that with the great majority of people, they may with lip service claim God, but when it comes right down to walking in the old paths and seeking them and asking for them, they'll say, we won't do it. But Jesus came in John 14, 6. He declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I suggest to you that we need to be concerned this hour with Jesus as the way. When you think of asking for the old paths, Jesus is the way. The Lord stressed that by our coming to him, the way, you shall find rest unto your souls. People try to find rest and peace in all sorts of ways, and they try to find it by saying, 
Yes, Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, he's the Savior of the world. But they need to hear him ask, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So we must be concerned about the Lord's way when we talk about the restoration of New Testament Christianity. We talk about its relationship to the unity for which Jesus prayed and the Apostle Paul commanded and the Bible authorized. We must determine to walk in the Lord's way no matter the sacrifice, no matter the pain, because the way of the cross leads home. Sometimes we forget there is a cross for everyone. And Jesus himself laid the foundation for that song when he says, you take up your cross and follow me. Too often Christianity has been painted as simply wearing some sort of gold or silver cross around your neck or on your lapel or something. We need to remember there was a day when that old cross in the mind of the people of the Roman Empire would be like us wearing an electric chair around our neck as an emblem. It was a sign, an emblem of shame and anguish and pain. It's only become something else, the emblem of Christianity, without that thought. And yet, Paul echoed Christ and he said, All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We must understand we have enjoyed peace and contentment in the church of our Lord as it's been restored in a way that Paul probably never knew it. And we need to know then that God in his infinite uh, providential care has allowed us to know that. But that doesn't mean that we may have to face fiery furnaces in the future. And for some, it seems the coals are already burning. We need to understand that when it comes then to the significance of the restoration and unity. In Titus 1, verses 1 through 3, Paul said, and it's significant, to a young preacher this. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before times eternal, but in his own season manifested his words in the message wherewith I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior. Now in this, Paul is emphasizing that God promised and prepared for eternal life. And also that he has revealed that plan, the way to go to heaven, the way that is the Christ, to mankind. All who will have the expectation of eternal life, who are earnestly desiring, must be concerned about that plan. The plan whereby God reveals that we can go to heaven. The plan pertaining to seeking the old path, asking for them, desiring to walk therein. The way of Jesus Christ. That there can be a restoration of the Bible to its place as the final rule of faith and practice in all things of religion and morals that you can restore the plan of salvation recorded in the New Testament of Christ and the church found upon the pages and so on, its worship, its organization, its work. It's made clear when Paul tells Timothy, another preacher, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, and the thing that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now that within itself, besides other things, explicitly and presented in the Bible implicitly, makes it clear that there is such a thing as a restoration that is authorized by God. But I want to pause here and notice some other matters in the scriptures that show us all the way back before the time of Israel or Judah's return from Babylonian captivity. We need to look at this for a moment. Because we have in the days of Josiah a restoration movement. And I want us to consider that just for a moment. This passage of scripture reminds me to a great extent of what you have in Ezra and Nehemiah, as I said a while ago. In uh, 2 Kings chapter 22, we find this be 
passage of Scripture beginning in verse 8, And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, Marvelous statement, I have found the book of the law. Now that's wonderful enough. They found what they were looking for. But brethren, what he says right here is exactly where we are today. Look where he found it. Well, that means it was lost. But he found it. But he said, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. How can you lose the Bible in, in the church? You're seeing it happen already today. Just simply deny absolute objective truth as it applies to the divine volume and deny the importance of adequate evidence and credible testimony to prove anything. And you've lost the book of the law in the house of God. And it needs to be restored. And some of those who preach it just like it is are unwilling to apply it consistently. Everybody and in every case and every situation. There's a problem right there. That's how we're losing it now. Respect the persons, which is as big a sin as fornication ever thought about being. And that's very important to understand. Notice what is said in verse 13 of this record, written aforetime for our learning, the church's learning, how to use this under the authority of Christ in the New Testament, Romans 15, 4. Listen. Go ye, inquire the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that which is written concerning us. Not just through the big things a group of big name preachers have got together and decided it's important enough to deal with and leave the other stuff they think little alone. But according to everything the book of the law says is important. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind. The attitude that we need to take to restore things as God wants them in his book to have the oneness for which Jesus prayed and is authorized by the Bible is also seen in the latter part of 2 Kings chapter 22. <clears throat> Notice, because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou heardest what I spake against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me. I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Now you're talking about the binding up of wounds is when a person has humbled himself as described in this way. And God says, I'll hear you. I have in this case heard you. Behold, therefore, we talk around here a lot of teaching when you see hints. And therefore, wherefore, Arguments have been made. Here's the conclusion. In the light of that, he says, Therefore I will gather thee into thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace. And thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I'll bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. That's an amazing statement. More to it. They spent a lot of time on it. There's sermon after sermon found even in that. But the point being... We must have the right attitude toward God's law. The law can be, and I'm afraid with many, has been lost in the house of God. But it can be found. They found it. They found it because they had the humble, contrite, repentant heart. We'll find it again when we do that. Let me go now to some things that have to do with more of the scheme of redemption. Suffice it to say, in what we said earlier, God unfolded his plan to save man throughout many generations. Most of us in this room, maybe many who are hearing us over the internet or will hear later on through the technology available to us today, know of the unfolding from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob into the children of Israel. The design and purpose of the law of Moses for the children of Israel, as Paul echoed it, that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But when that faith has come, we're no longer under schoolmaster. For we're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized to Christ, put on Christ. 
There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. They're all one. There's unity. One in Christ. And if you be Christ, then are your heirs according to the promise. You are of the seed of Abraham, as it were. The promise made to him, and that's what it all had to do with. It wasn't so much the land promise in Genesis chapter 12 or even you to Isaac and Jacob. That was necessary for Israel to be there because Christ, according to the flesh, had to come from Israel, and specifically uh, the tribe of Judah and of the family of David. But the ultimate was that through thy seed, singular, shall all nations of the earth be blessed. We can't have the restoration of the Bible back to its position as the final rule of faith and practice, we'll never see anybody blessed ultimately and finally as God intends in spiritual forgiveness of sins, reconciliation to him, and eternal salvation in heaven. All of this we read of in the scriptures until we get down to the time of, of the gospel in Christ. That is, as he worked on this earth, as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The good message, the gospel message, it relates to the possibility of and the means of the actual forgiveness of sins. Number two of the spiritual blessings to be had in Christ, Ephesians 1, 3, where he locates all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, they're in Christ. And number three, the blessed expectation of eternal life that every child of God is faithful yearns to possess, for we have the right to expect it, and God's promised it to us, and thus Paul would write, we're saved by hope. Romans 8 and verse 24. We find the Great Commission naturally being something that would follow, for if the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, and Paul said it, it is, Romans 1 16, then it must be preached to every creature because each person that needs it is a free moral agent, and they must be given the opportunity to make choice. And thus, as the gospel is preached to them, and the fundamentals of it are set out in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, then men make that choice. The church is on this earth to save souls by the proclamation of the gospel to those who have never heard it, the education of spiritual building up of the saints, and then through benevolent activity to help those who can't help themselves. In that way, we are to reach out to people with the gospel. When you look into the New Testament, you see that apostolic history summarizes God's amazing and sacred plan of salvation. Those folks preach our Lord's church when they preached the gospel message. They preached that which was and is the source of saving faith, the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. That saving faith through knowledge of the truth and the confidence it produced in God Christ, the gospel system, caused them to understand the importance of repenting of their sins, Acts 17, verse 30. That faith, that saving faith, caused them to obey other passages that these taught that they were to confess their faith in Christ. And then, of course, they were qualified to be immersed in water by the authority of Jesus Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that their sins might be forgiven. The Lord add them to the church. Remission of sins would be theirs and the church existing on earth. Isn't that simple? But it demands a lot out of the inner man to have to understand and grasp and be moved by being convicted of one's sins and turning to Christ for the Lord's term to set out the word of God and a willingness to submit to his will no matter the sacrifices we must make in this life. That he demands of us, less than that he does not. Now, those in Christ were variously designated we think today specifically, and we won't go into all of this, so the name Christian, meaning of Christ, disciples in the sense of learners, uh, brothers and sisters in that we're of the family of God, with our Heavenly Father, uh, members of the body of Christ, the body actually like a human body and so on. Uh, all of these particular descriptions of the saved institution give us deeper insight into what the church really is. But in time, we need to know that men departed from the divine plan. And when they depart, departed from the divine plan, then, of course, there went all the superstructure. Because it is the divine plan, the authority of Jesus Christ, the New Testament of the Christ, that, of course, gives us all that we are insofar as Christianity is concerned. The Lord had warned of such things because he presented the way. Remember, he is the way. 
He presented the way as a straight and narrow way, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. In his own work and his ministry, he warned the false teachers, Matthew 7 and verse 15. Notice that Paul is right after him talking about the way to heaven being a straight and narrow way, restricted by the authority of Jesus Christ. And in those apostolic days, even while the New Testament was being written, there were those who were already working to depart from the apostolic order of things. Paul said to a young preacher, uh, the Spirit speaks expression. In latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know, those folks didn't just exist in the days of Paul and right after. They didn't stop then. They're here today. False doctrine travels by people propagating it just like the gospel travels. False teachers will damn your soul. Galatians 1 makes it clear, to put it mildly, God doesn't like them. In effect, the Apostle Paul twice said, specifically concerning those false teachers who were the Judaizing teachers, that they ought to be cut off. Well, do you know what that means? Cut off from God means lost in the devil's hell. That's what God thinks of those who teach doctrines that if you believe and obey them, will send you to torment. He certainly doesn't like those who teach false doctrines. Paul said further, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. There was a time in the church when gospel preachers weren't very long saying this in every sermon. I remember my father telling me under the preaching that he converted him in the 50s, that that's one of the things that he picked up on rather quickly was there was a difference in what's called the church of Christ in the denominational world. When's the last time you heard a denominational preacher quoting a passage of scripture? And when's the last time you heard Ruby Shelley quote well, the time will come when they will not endure. What is it they won't endure? Well, Ken said that I was strong like pickle juice the other morning. So just pucker up. Uh, they have itching ears. They want the ears scratched. They want to be told they're all right while they know they're in transgression to God's will. That's exactly what they want. And so what are they going to do? Heap of themselves teachers having itching ears. So they can be strapped. They're not going to like it when you teach the truth because they're not loving the truth. They're going to turn away from their ears from the truth. They're going to be turned on the faithful. Listen, anything that's not of the New Testament truth, that's not authorized by the New Testament, just put it in the pigeonhole of faithless. You see also that Paul referred to the falling away. He talked about how that the mystery of iniquity or lawlessness was even at work while he wrote these words in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 7. I think the only thing that stopped it from happening even at that time was because the apostles walked this earth. And folks, I wouldn't want to have a mad apostle after me. Now, you know, sometimes we don't realize that, but the apostles knew how to discipline. And I'm quite sure the fire would fly. I think we get a little peek at that when you see a couple of folks call them nice and fire. At least they didn't talk back. He was speaking to the, uh, the elders of the church in Ephesus when he referred to dangers that men would arise from among themselves. And they would have one idea. We want a following because that's what we want. We like to be upheld. We want our own following. We want our own group. I firmly believe to a great extent, not everybody that's involved, but a lot of these parachurch organizations you heard about the last hour and most of us are familiar with, a lot of times it's men who have their own ingenuity at work to say, look what we have done, and this eclipses the divine institution of the church produced by humble spirits who obey the gospel. We can't allow that to happen. Nothing should be arrayed against God's good word which presents the way, or the church it produces, or the life of people in the church. There was departure in organization. There was, of course, departure in all manner of practices. There were all sorts of departures over a period of 700 years. And we won't go into all of that kind of thing. Why? Because of what Paul said earlier about itching ears, the people who love fables more than the gospel. It didn't all happen at once. The devil's a very slow and deliberate being. He doesn't 
get in a hurry like we do sometimes. He's content to work his course very easily. I, I remember seeing my grandmother who was tremendous at crocheting. I could see her now work, just take care of the conversation and make the smallest little whatever they were, just that hand just working like this. And I said, what are you making? A bedspread. I've got, I've got a bedspread she made at home. Amazing thing. Every little thing is making that bedspread. She knew what she was doing. She was patient with it. She made a bad spread. You know, we could use some of that in the church of being steadfast, unmovable, always around the work of the Lord, not trying to get the Lord's work done this afternoon or tomorrow morning, but to be stick with it. Never quit. Go on and on and on and on and never stop. Don't have to be a flash in the pan. Oh, well, we didn't get it done by next week, so it's no, no good. Stay with it. Never quit. Never quit. The word won't return void. It'll accomplish what God wants it to do. Stay with it. What we're doing now may be better for the church 50 years from now than it will be today because it can be preserved. Who knows? We look at our lifetime. We want it straightened up before we leave this earth. God's not on my timetable. But what I do now may very well do tremendous things in the future. So why should I let myself be not flat on the floor and depressed because everything's not working the way I want it right now. Though I know my Bible, is it the same yesterday and today and a hundred years ago? Yeah. Well, then keep preaching it. Would you like to have the auditorium full full? Yes, but it's not. So what? Preach it. It's recorded. It's done. Do the Lord's will in our lifetime. And we haven't reached the stage quite like Noah faced yet. So let's keep on keeping on with the restoration of the ancient order of things. In time, men sought to return to the divine plan, and yet it took years for that to happen. In Italy, there were the labors of a fellow by the name of uh, Claudius of Turin, who died about 839. Peter of Bruges, who died in 1126. Also in France, there were the Albigenses, who worked around 1170. There were the Waldensians at about the same time. William of Ockham worked in England uh, for Reformation in 1280 to 1349. There were the wonderful labors of a fellow by the name of John Wycliffe in England, 1324 and 1384. Uh, John Huss worked in Bohemia, 1369 and so on. Uh, Germany, there was the work of uh, John Ruslin in 1455. Also, there was his uncle Melanchthon and Jerome Savonarola worked in Italy and 1452 and Holland. All of these basically were laying the groundwork for the Reformation. They never even saw that, but they were working under tremendous pressure and persecution and threats of Roman Catholicism that governed every thought of life. But then came the, the Protestant Reformation, and you have all sorts of folks involved. We won't go back into that, such as Luther and the one that really stood out closer to what the Campbells tried to do was Ulrich Zwingli. He actually advocated to do only what's authorized, but Luther eclipsed him. Zwingli died earlier. John Calvin came along from him. John Knox got Presbyterianism into Scotland, and so on. But let me tell you something that you may not know. Now, Brother Ken Chumley will remember he let me have a copy of this. Records of the English Church copied from the original by L. H. Channing, who was a very faithful gospel preacher, been dead for a number of years. He produced this back in 1980-some-odd. I think it says here about 85. This is the uh, record of the um, little church at Cottle Bank around 1669. Now, really, Campbell and his people in America didn't reach to about, the best we can tell from this information, reach to where they were in their understanding to, oh, I don't know, around 1820 probably, 1830, close to it. These folks called themselves the Church of Christ. They baptized for the remission of sin. They observed the Lord's Supper and their worship on every first day of the week. They even through fellowship from folks. Maybe they're a little ahead of us on that. Uh, they did a number of things along that line. Now, were they totally restored in every little thing? Probably not. But the thing about this church is, this is a record all the way up through 1850-something, if I remember right. And thus they became a part of what we think of the Restoration when that began to influence even from this direction over there, and thus it developed. Uh, that tells me then that the Campbells not only were influenced 
by the folks they were around in Northern Ireland, Thomas Campbell being influenced by them, and even Alexander, the Sandymans and others. But it tells me that the Sandymans and others may have had their knowledge of a lot of things that were going on back there in this day and time that was more common than we realize at this particular time in history. So what I'm trying to say is there were things going on before what we know is restoration history that our efforts to restore ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity that we're familiar with uh, from the Campbells and Stones and so forth had their roots going away back there. Now, Brother King can verify this, but I've seen him when he could look considerably younger back then, standing in front of an old building that was built back in 1600 that the Baptist control. And the Baptist preacher is out there, and he's holding a communion. I believe it was silver, wasn't it, Ken? Silver communion set, and Ken said, the Baptist preacher said, this is really yours, not ours. Meaning what? There had been the Church of Christ in that building, but most of those back in those days finally apostatized and went to the Baptist church, and the communion set was still there those people used. Now, we're not trying to trace all the way back to people actually existing as the Church of Christ for the Pentecost. That's not the point. The point is, as long as this Bible is on this earth and there are people who have contrived hearts and will accept it as the only rule of faith and practice, here they make that clear. They make it clear the Bible is the only rule of faith and practice. Now, they'll refer sometimes to their preachers as pastors, but they had elders. They'll refer sometimes to them as reverends. But many times they're referring to them also as Mr. This came to do this and Mr. That came to do that. They were far away from the Church of England. And they were not tainted by Methodism when it came along in the 1700s and so on and so forth. The point is, wherever there are people, the very point that we want to make now is this. The seed being the Word of God, Luke 8, 11. Eyes to good hearts, Luke 8, 15. Can take this Bible. And when properly divided, 2 Timothy 2, 15, and when they're willing to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ, the way, and ask for the old paths as it is in Jesus, in the authority of the New Testament, Colossians 3, 17, guess what they're going to learn? They're going to learn the way of salvation. They're going to learn the path of salvation. They're going to learn about the church. And they're going to be able to produce today what was produced in the first century when the gospel was still fresh and new and people simply accepted that and the seed principle brought forth of its kind. I believe that, brethren. I stake my life on the fact that you can have the, the church wherever people will follow the Bible and the Bible only that will make Christians and Christians only. Folks, that's God's unity. That, that works. And I don't care all these other trappings and stuff people get into. What I'm giving you today, not because I gave it to you, used to be sounded out throughout the land. It was fresh news back in the early 1800s, back toward the east. And you got to remember, our nation in those days was far less in population than it is now. And yet those people in that day and time where they were Presbyterians or Baptists, they still believed their creed was upheld by this book. They know any better. But when you begin to point out that their creed was not even lawful to be there in the first place, all you need is the Bible and the Bible only, then they thought was yoke. Because they're unlike some of our own brethren today. They had what's called conviction and the courage of their conviction. Do you realize that the folks who won't pay attention to us on some of these matters, and I always saw sum it up when it comes down to the matter of Dave Miller, they don't have any conviction. They have enough conviction to say don't have any and let us alone. Have you noticed they charge us with being jealous and envious and factionist? Why don't they deal with the points that we make that Dave Miller called a false doctrine? He sinned their body and he has not repented of it and they won't fellowship it. That's it. If they had held the same view and acted the way they've acted 30 years ago, when it came to James D. Bales and his teaching on marriage, divorce, remarriage, they would never have stood up against Brother Bales and his teaching. There's no reason to believe they would have, because by their fruit you shall know them, and I know the fruit they're bearing now, because I can see it. And they're saying, let it alone. It's really not that bad. That's exactly their idea. Well, who determines that? This has been the question I've asked all along. Who decides among all things that are contrary to the Bible, this is not that bad? What would have happened if you had gotten down to the situation with Nadab and Abihu or Uzzah? 
Now think about poor old us. The ox cart, when the ox stumbled, he just did naturally what Aeneas had done and stabilized the ark and got dead. And who killed him? Must have been David Brown contending for the faith. <laughs> Because God is love. And the apostle love said so. Surely a God who is love would not have done that. The man was sincere in what he did. I know the soul will say one sincere in what he did. What am I made out of the bind you? Well, they tried to excuse them because it said they were drunk. Well, it still means that you're not in possession of your faculties. You better get in possession of them because when you do something not authorized, God's going to kill you for it. So whether they were drunk and they didn't pay attention to the authority of God or whether they just didn't pay any attention to it, didn't think it was important. God still said that fire and die. Now I want to know, what impact does that have on me today and my approach to the way that is Christ in his gospel? And Jesus himself said, if you love me, support you the end. And may I say this, we are not in opposition to any group of brethren organized in any way that's according to the truth of God's will to preach the gospel of the whole world. Don't tell me where we are. We're not opposed to that. But we're opposed to any group of people who say, it just doesn't make much difference about Dave Miller. Just ignore it and go on. Y'all are a bunch of folks that are so narrow you see through a keyhole both by the same time. Now that's just not going to cut it with me. Uh, and maybe that I'll have to be isolated. I kind of get, don't you get the idea of knowing his family is a little bit isolated? Amen. But I think they were kind of glad to be isolated when they were shut in by God in his ark. I don't know whether it was possible or not the way that deluge and phantasmagoric upheaval that came when God destroyed the world allowed for such a thing. But I just don't believe they were fussing at God to say, open the door, if there were folks scratching on the door and pleading to get in. It was God who put them in there, and they built the thing according to all that God commanded Noah. So did he. And Hebrews 11 makes it very clear by faith. And Noah built an ark to the saving of his house. Now, what kind of example is that to you and me relative to our response to the truth? Therefore... The restoration of the ancient order of things is dependent upon our willingness to learn how to respect the authority of God's Word. To learn how, as I said on Sunday morning, to ascertain that authority and do only what is authorized. Colossians 3, 17, leaving undone what is not authorized and that which is absolutely forbidden and being content to do that. I remember hearing Brother Franklin Camp years ago about 72, somewhere along there. <laughs> he had his own way about doing it. But he said, they're going to try to make a Pentecostal holiness denomination out of us. And he said, I don't care. I can't do it like you did it, Brother Doug. I don't care if you've got a crippled man and a blind woman. But faithful to God, assemble with them and work with them. Have to be your home. And that's what I feel about it. I'd like to know when we got the idea that everybody on earth has to agree with the truth before I can agree with the truth right. and submit to it. What we need today in order to have the unity that God wants us to have, we all read of it in the New Testament, is to have the courage that people like Mark Warren Stone had. Do you realize when he started out, he had to go against the grain on about everything he did? Where was there the church of Christ down the road that he could go to to get help from? Where was the Presbyterian preacher that was going to assist him in what he was doing? Where was he going to get solace from his own family to encourage him? You ought to read some of his writings about how he was treated when he took the position, we'll go by the Bible, the Bible only. We don't know where it's going to lead, but wherever it leads, it'll be the right way. We're going with it. And until we decide to say we're going to go wherever this divine volume leads us, whether anybody else goes with us or not, the ultimate end will be heaven itself anyway. So then we're not going to be up to the task that we face today and the future holds. But as for me, and to the best of my ability, my house, we're going to serve Jehovah. You choose you this day whom you will serve. Thank you.